Okay, we're going to talk about scalp anatomy and answer the what questions. What are the layers of the scalp and what arteries and nerves supply the scalp? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So the boundary of the scalp are through the anteriorly through the supraorbital margins of the frontal bone here and then also laterally through the temporal fascia which attaches along the zygomatic arch and temporal bone and then posteriorly through the occipital bone along the superior nuchal line and external occipital protuberance. And so the layers of the scalp, um, to do that, we're going to take this little coronal section from there. We're going to blow it up, and there we have a coronal section of the head. And then the, the orientation of this image is there's the layers of the scalp, which we're going to focus on in this tutorial. But then there is the skull bones, and there are the meninges, and there is the brain. Now, the layers of the scalp are as follows. Skin, connective tissue, aponeurosis, loose connective tissue, and pericranium. Now, you might ask myself, ask me, hey, ask me self, good grammar. How do I remember these five layers? Shing, because the first letter all spells scalp. And from superficial to deep, those are all the layers. So let's do that. We're gonna go through each one by one. First, skin. The skin is the epidermis and the dermis, has hair follicles, sebaceous glands, and the hair follicles are the big one that helps to keep conserve heat and also gives aesthetic social purposes like this really pretty lady here. That's my wife, Celine. Uh, now the connective tissue, we all have this like basically adipose or loose uh, adipose tissue uh, fat that's deep to that. And that's what houses a lot of the terminal ends of the uh, cutaneous nerves and blood vessels. Then the aponeurotic layer, the aponeurosis, this one we're going to show in this bottom left picture in this lateral view. Here we see the frontalis muscle coming from the uh, supraorbital margin and the occipitalis muscle coming from the occipital bone. And these two muscles are attached by this dense connective tissue membrane called the galea aponeurotica that goes widely uh, to the sides that fuses with the temporal fascia, which goes goes down to the zygomatic arch. Now, this galea aponeurotica is what, um, I'm so going to show first, the skin, connective tissue, and aponeurosis, those three layers really function together, which is often in anatomy called it the scalp proper. And so if you have a superficial skin laceration in the skin or the connective tissue layer, that aponeurosis will actually keep those two uh, areas of cut skin pretty close together, so it's actually pretty easy to suture. But if we then do a deeper cut, like you see that dotted line in the aponeurosis, then what happens is the frontalis and occipitalis muscles contract and gape open that wound. So laceration causes uh, a opening of the galea aponeurotica, the frontalis and occipitalis muscles contract in opposite direction and the wound gapes open. Now, the loose connective tissue layer that's deep to that, or the areolar connective tissue, um, this is where blood and pus and infection can spread all across the scalp. Now, I show those emissary veins for the following reasons. This fourth layer of the scalp is the danger area because blood and pus can go all the way through this area, and an infection though it's not necessarily blood, but pus and infection have a possible though unlikely route to go from this loose connective tissue layer through the emissary veins inside the cranial vault and cause an infection like meningitis. The last layer is called the pericranium. This is really the periosteum, which is on the outside of the skull bones um, knitted. So the pericranium or periosteum is knitted to the bone. And so there are the layers of the scalp, except it looks like it says plaques, but that's because scalp is just spelt that way. Okay, there's the layers of the scalp. Now the cutaneous innervation of the scalp, I'm going to teach this through doing through the back, front, and lateral parts of the scalp. So first let's look at the posterior scalp. And so that cutaneous innervation is by the greater occipital nerve and the lesser occipital nerve. And to see those two, let's take a cross section of the C2 spinal cord and spinal nerve. Watch the greater occipital nerve comes down and goes through the dorsal ramus, and the lesser occipital nerve comes down and goes through the ventral ramus, but they both go through that dorsal root. That lesser occipital nerve is associated with the cervical plexus. The greater occipital nerve, those who do dissections, you're gonna see that really big nerve in the back right by the suboccipital triangle. Now the anterior scalp, we have the supraorbital and supertrochlear nerves. And if we look at this picture here, um, the V1 branch from the trigeminal nerve or the ophthalmic nerve gives rise to many branches, the supraorbital and supertrochlear nerve being two of them. And then in the lateral scalp, we have the, a small zygomatical temporal branch from V2, but also this larger auriculotemporal nerve from V3, uh, the mandibular branch of trigeminal nerve. And there are all the cutaneous nerves of the scalp. They're also the nerves that make it feel really good when you have one of those scalp massagers. Oh, if you ever have one of those, that, that's a good way to 
finish a really long study break. Now, the vascular supply to the scalp, or the arteries, are as follows. They come branches from the external and internal carotid arteries. So let's take a look at external carotid first. Occipital, posterior auricular, and superficial temporal branches. So the occipital arteries that come get their name because they're overlying the occipital bone. The posterior auricular arteries get their names because they're behind the ear. Posterior, behind auricular, the ear. And the superficial temporal artery gets its name because they're the superficial arteries overlying the temporal bone. And these arteries particularly important in a uh, con rheumatological condition called giant cell arteritis or temporal arteritis. And in this superficial uh, photograph, you can see that superficial temporal artery. It's the most common large vessel vasculitis. And it's primarily affecting the cranial arteries in the aorta. And the big one is the superficial temporal artery. And that's the most direct vessel to take a biopsy to check to see if they really have vasculitis. Uh, now, the internal carotid artery branches. So there's our internal carotid artery. And so if we follow that up the neck, it hits the base of the skull. And then what happens is we need to get blood vessels to the above the eye to supply the front of the scalp. But how do we do that? Well, that internal carotid artery courses through the carotid canal, through the cavernous sinus, and then gives rise to ophthalmic branches that connect right there. And then they give rise to the superorbital and supertrochlear branches or arteries that supply to the front of the scalp. Now, what we'll notice is that there are rich anastomotic connections through all these scalp arteries. And anastomosis, that means a connection between adjacent structures, and in this case, arteries. So there is an artery, there's an artery, artery, artery. And notice all those anastomotic connections. And because of that, there's a really rich blood supply to the scalp, which makes it very easy for the head to give off a lot of heat, which is why it's very important in the wintertime to wear your toque. Good Canadian term there. Now, scalp lacerations bleed profusely because you have so many anastomotic connections and also because cut vessels bleed from both ends. If we cut there, that uh, if the vessel bleeds from this end and this end. So if we take this and blow that up, what happens is where usually when you cut a vessel, the vessel only bleeds from the end being pumped from the heart, but in the case of um, scalp arteries, they bleed from both ends. And then you have this really rich connective tissue network in the scalp that also helps keep the ends of these vessels open. So people who have head injuries, especially if they fall and hit their head, they bleed not only because the bleeds from both ends, but because these ends of the vessels are kept open. So for scalp anatomy, there's the scalp with all of its layers. There's the nerves coming from C2 spinal nerve branches and from the trigeminal nerve, V1, V2, and V3. And then all the arteries to the scalp, which are branches from the internal and external carotid arteries. And that, my friends, is scalp anatomy in a nutshell.